Good morning or afternoon, everybody, depending on where you're from. We'll give a few minutes for people to continue coming into the webinar, and I will get us started. You see the numbers are still going up. Numbers are still going up. We'll just wait another minute. Okay, I think we'll get started. It is just a minute after 10. The numbers are still climbing, um, but we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody to um, the Social Media Toolkit training on the eve of the 50th anniversary of the Extension Master Gardener Program, Washington State University has spent more than a year planning to honor those who came before us to celebrate today's successes and to look to the future of our program. We have key messages and a list of tools and resources available to you on our website. I'll put those links in the chat here pretty soon. Um, and you can also view a promo video um, and a short story of how it all began on our 50th Years and Counting webpage, and I'll share that link as well. So this training will focus on the Social Media Toolkit. We at WSU want to celebrate far and wide the good work being done by Extension Master Gardeners across the United States. This kit contains WSU specific priorities. For those of you in other states, please feel free to change out our priorities with the pro priorities of your own Extension Master Gardener program. So the purpose of this shared training is to help all of us use the social media kit to celebrate 50 years of the Extension Master Gardener Program in 2023. A little bit of housekeeping for you. This is a webinar. That means um, your cameras are off and uh, the chat is not available to you. We'll ask that you use the Q&A feature that you should be able to find at the bottom of your screen. If you type your questions into there, we'll be able to help you answer them. And you also should be able to raise your hand. If you want to raise your hand uh, to ask a question, please please do so. I think there's um, few enough of us on this call that we might be able to manage that. Um, but if we find that we that's um, not manageable, we'll go back to that Q and A. We'll make sure that all your your questions get answered. I'm going to turn it over now to to Kim and to Scott. Kim um, Schmaus is newly uh, moved here to Spokane, Washington, actually, from the UK, where she spent uh, the past 25 years working in marketing and communications in the arts sector with flagship arts venues and companies in London and across the UK. She is a multidiscipline marketing mix and comm senior strategist and joined WSU in April of this year. A committed lifelong learner, she holds numerous qualifications and a variety of interests and also provides executive coaching and career training for cultural and nonprofit senior professionals internationally. She's also the president of the nonprofit Spokane Mama. Thank you, Kim. We appreciate the um, you're giving us your time today. And Scott, Thank you for, for being here and giving us your time today. I'm gonna to let Scott introduce himself. Hi, I'm Scott Waybright. Um, this is mostly Kim's show. I'm gonna be answering questions because I do the social media for 
the WSU College of Agricultural, Human, and Natural Resource Sciences um, for the college accounts, uh, not the smaller like departmental accounts, but the overall college on Facebook, Twitter, and until recently, Instagram. So I can handle or ask answer questions that are more nuts and bolts on how to um, do things on social media. But uh, now I'll turn it over to Kim to do her presentation. Thank you, Scott, and welcome, Kim. Thank you very much. Um, welcome everyone. Um, thank you very much for spending your time with us today. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, wherever you may be. Um, yes, so I created the social media toolkit, which um, sits on the Extension Master Gardener's anniversary page. Um, I hope some of you have had an opportunity to read through it because it will certainly help um, you understand what I'm talking about in this presentation. If not, worry not. This is being recorded and you can re-watch it um, alongside uh, going through the toolkit. It's quite a meaty document. Um, it was uh, created with you in mind um, to help you extend the reach of your social media efforts beyond your usual um, audience. And I'm going to talk through, um, you know, it, we're not going to talk through every page of the toolkit because that would take far too long. Um, but we will go, be going through the goals of this campaign. And by that, I mean the social media campaign as it relates to the anniversary. We'll have a look at um, the audiences that you'll be trying to reach with your campaign. And then we're going to look at which social media platforms we're advising you utilize where to post your content, what content to po post and how to vary that and keep it interested, interesting rather for your um, readers. And then we're going to focus in on um, hashtags and tagging because those are two ways that really help get your posts out to more people. And they can be quite confusing. There are a couple of videos in this presentation as well. If we have time, we will watch those whilst we're live here. If not, you can you will, will have access to this presentation and you'll be able to watch them at your leisure. But um, we will have five opportunities for you to ask questions. Um, so we will stop intermittently throughout this presentation. And I think it's more important that you have access to myself and Scott um, so that you can ask your burning questions and then you can watch the video um, about tagging and hashtags at your leisure. So that's what we're going to be covering. Without further ado, let's uh, crack on, as they say in the UK. So um, there are overall campaign goals for the anniversary year. Um, and some of these will chime with the campaign goals for this. But what when Jennifer and I were talking about the brief for this toolkit, I wanted to hone in and say, like, what what are the campaign goals for the campaign overall, but also for social media? So and Jennifer, chime in here if you wish to. I've shortened these. They're in the toolkit and there's a much more lengthy version to help you understand more fully what we mean by each of these four goals. Um, but the first one is really to to really recognize and show appreciation for the huge um, nationwide uh, effort that you volunteers make um, to engage with the community and to bring to life um, the Extension Master Gardener program for your communities and to celebrate and applaud that um, whilst also sharing the successes the accomplishments and the really significant impact that you're able to make um, across your local area. Um, we also want to share um, and benefit from the fund development opportunities, of course, as well. Um, and here in Washington, we have nine program priorities. Now, if you're in a different state, you will have your own priorities, some of which may chime with those in Washington, but um, we do always try and link what we're doing to national initiatives to really show how what we do really speaks to what's happening across the US. 
So you'll be well aware, I'm sure, of national initiatives in the areas of climate change and food security and these other areas that you can see before you. So whilst you're thinking about your content, there may be something happening on a national level that you can post about and link it back to the Extension Master Gardener programme and the anniversary year. So be mindful of the fact that there are direct links and direct angles and stories to be plucked out of what's happening on a national level and pulling it back to your local level. OK. So I'm a marketeer. I always talk about target audiences because if you don't know who you're trying to reach, how on earth do you know what to say to them? So it really starts with this. You, goals and audiences so important. They're the foundations of any kind of marketing or campaigning. So it's very obvious, but let's state it anyway. The people who follow you, whether they follow you on social media or whether they follow you on an email list that you might have or a website that you have, those are your number one fans. They're the people who are going to be waving your flag, hopefully sharing your content and talking about you in real life. Um, and so those are your, your sort of your big fans. But beyond that, we really want to re reach beyond that because this is such an important moment um, that we want to not just go speak to the people that are already converted. The other people who may be interested in what you've got to say are those that have a similar demographic to you. And I literally mean you. So what are what do you where do you go? What do you follow? What do you listen to? What are your interests? And that will get your motor going, your brain motor, the gray cells into how you might reach other people like you. They'll also have a similar demographic. I'm going to pause for a second to just explain the word demographic. I really don't want to teach grandmother to suck eggs. I don't know if that's just a UKism. But um, by demographic, what I mean is um, the people who have a similar kind of profile to you. So your gender, ethnicity, age, um, your interests, the kind of car you drive, you know, it can get quite granular, but that's what I mean. Um, so a similar demographic to your current audience. Um, Scott, it may be worth you just speaking briefly, if we have time, about how to look at um, the demographics of audiences on Facebook and Instagram so that the um, volunteers can actually see how they can then further extrapolate from that. Um, anyone who's an att attended an event that you've held, if you're not already capturing their data and information, then please think about doing so because then you can reach out to them in future. And of course, people who are interested in gardening, the environment, conservation, and food security, or any other um, strands that you work on and talk about in your area. And anyone interested in community engagement and volunteering who probably has some kind of um, cross segment over into gardening and those other sort of key areas that I mentioned. Um, so, you know, anyone interested in community engagement and volunteering who's following the American Heart Association, maybe not quite so relevant, not irrelevant, but, you know, you're going for the sort of key target audiences here. You can't reach everybody um, much as you might wish to. So I know we've only just started, but I'm going to pause for questions there because I really want to give you the opportunity to ask Scott and myself anything that um, you may have. And Jennifer, I'm assuming you're adjudicating on the questions. Yes, I am. Yeah, there was great. One um, in the Q&A, somebody was wondering if the slides were, would be made available. So I answered that um, in the Q&A. And yes, we can make the slides available. Great. Any other questions? Please put them in the Q&A or raise your hand. I can see there's a couple there. So uh, I'll just read them aloud. And then if you want to answer um, Kim or Scott. So 
first one, is there an interest in expanding our demographic or literally stay with what we have? I think there's definitely an interest in expanding our demographic. Um, as extension, we have a responsibility to serve all audiences. And some of those audiences may not know who we are, what we do, or why we do it. And this campaign will help us tell our story and attract new audiences that maybe didn't know they um, were in alignment or um, had similar interests as, as the um, what the Master Gardener program provides. Yeah, just to, to, re to reiterate, really, um, uh, always look to expand your demographic um, and reach new audiences. Um, and you may be surprised about the kind of people who are really interested in what you've got to say that may, you may not have uh, come across before. Right, right. Um, how do we find out the national objectives to mirror post content about or build a campaign? You know what that means, Kim? What is... I'm assuming, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm assuming that means when I was talking about national initiatives. Yeah. So um, I'm not, I mean, Jennifer can probably speak to this better than I, um, in terms of what national initiatives the government are leading um, that might be relevant to link content into. Right, so... Um... It's, you know, nationally, some of the um, objectives or, or initiatives in the Extension Master Gardener program um, are pollinators, you know, pollinator health, pollinator habitat, uh, food, food security, and, um, you know, community development, health and wellness, and there's a number of things. And I think in the toolkit, some of those things are addressed. Um, the National Extension Master Gardener Committee, um, which is con consists of um, Extension Master Gardener coordinators from around the states, uh, come together regularly, and we're, we are consistently working on um, telling the story of the Extension Master Gardener program across the state. So some of that will be available as time goes. Um, over over the months and years, really, this is uh, the big job on these mm -hmm. national initiatives. Um, so somebody said, "I'm not on Facebook, Twitter, etc. Why should I be listening?" <laughs> I'm going to pass that one to Scott. Um, this is a social media toolkit webinar so if you're not using social media at all I honestly don't know why you would be here maybe that's not a political answer but yeah right. <laughs> so, so but what I, I mean my answer to that would be um and I don't know who this is I I don't know whether you're a volunteer or um a program coordinator or staff or faculty somewhere um but you're here because you care about the extension master gardener program and you probably know people who are on social media. This tool, this is being recorded. And if folks ask you about what they can do, you'll be able to provide them with this recording. I took that question as more about um, why would people be on social media? As in, why would people be listening to our content on social media? And I would say that. Um, well, people who are not interested in gardening and our content and all the things I've just described probably won't be interested in the content. And that's why we talk about target audiences um, and that you're delivering um, the right message at the right time to the right person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So somebody mentioned, I write uh, newsletter articles. I, I can apply this concept to the print articles. And he can answer the question, but absolutely, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And good question. Yes. I mean, you can extrapolate a lot of the, the theory behind this to your other content um, and your other campaign activities. 
And it looks like the last one, I think you'll cover later, but I'm going to ask it. If I'm, if I am on Facebook, but not other media outlets, do I still need hashtags? Up for um, debate, but Scott, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it is a, that is a common debate and a normal thing to think about. You can use them. Please, please do use, especially the main one. Um, but yeah, Facebook is not very hashtag friendly. So um, it's not as necessary as Instagram or Twitter would be. But especially the main ones, please still do because there is some utility. It's just not as uh, as useful as the other outlets. And another one was about reaching um, non-English speaking audiences. That's a tough one. Yeah. On that one. Well, for, I guess, first of all, um, you know, do you have someone who is bilingual enough to actually translate your content? Because um, Google Translate is not going to cut it for you, I'm afraid. Um, and so if you do, then that's all to the good. But again, you want to make sure if you're posting um, in a different language that you're posting in the right groups and the right pages on Facebook, the right accounts, um, and not just sending that out to people who it doesn't um, make any sense to. Um, so by all means, if you think you have a strong reason to target an audience who speaks Spanish, and you know you can reach those people, then by all means do so. Um, but I wouldn't seek that out unless you think that really is one of your key target audiences. Anything so I, else? I think I think we've answered all of them. People okay. are making suggestions about other um, other social media spaces. So right. Okay, we'll move on because we have four other question slots. Um, oh goodness me, I'm getting carried away. So, um, which social media platforms are we recommending for this? We are recommending Facebook and Instagram. If you have other accounts that run under the Extension Master Gardener, Pro Gardener Program that you want to use, like Twitter, then we're not saying don't do that. But if you need to focus just on two, these would be the two that we recommend because um, they are very visual platforms, especially Instagram. Um, they allow you to share content across um, different accounts, different um, messaging platforms within those apps. Um, and they tend to be, um, especially Facebook, they tend to meet the demographic of Extension Master gardeners or people who are interested in gardening. Um, we know from our own accounts um, that these are the two that tend to be most successful for um, WSU Connors um, and also for WSU uh, Master Gardeners. Um, I'm going to just quickly ask Scott to speak to the similarities and differences um, between those two platforms. I mean, I've pretty much written it out here for you, but um, I'd love it, Scott, if you could just talk a little bit more about these because you are at the coalface of them more than I am. Sure. Um... So first of the main main difference is that Instagram is completely visually dependent. Um, it's a photo it started as a photo, photo sharing uh, platform. It's still very photo heavy. It, it's expanded into video somewhat. but um, Facebook, you can post without a photo. Instagram, you literally cannot. Um, similar is that they're both uh, the same company. Instagram is owned by Meta, which is what Facebook changed its name to, basically, on a corporate level. So you can do some similar things um, because they're quite intertwined, at least behind the scenes. If you have a um, like a what's called a page on Facebook, you can connect it to an Instagram account, so you can get all of your insights so your statistics on who your audience is um, how much your posts 
like your audience, who you're reaching, the number of people you reach, the number of people that are reading your uh, stuff, the number of people that are clicking on things. You can get both from one single source. So that's kind of helpful. But um, yeah, that's, that's the main thing is photos being required and the key driver versus um, useful and, and necessary, but not um, be all end all. And of course, you can advertise on both of these platforms. If you have budget and you've got a piece of content that you really want to get in front of more people, because crucially, there are there is the dark art of um, algorithms behind these social media platforms that decides who gets to see your content. It's not like you have a thousand followers on Facebook and you post your content and Every one of those thousand followers gets that in their newsfeed, sadly. Um, it'll be a small proportion of those people that actually see it. So do consider if you do have any budget and if there are key messages, key posts, pieces of content um, that you want to ensure get in front of more eyeballs, then you can very simply um, do what's called boosting that post, which primarily shows it to the people who already follow you or you can go down a more complex route and create an actual advert for it, um, which is, you know, a whole different ball game, but it's, it is actually not that hard. Um, and it allows you to decide the parameters of who's going to see that advert, you know, male, female, age, locality, that sort of thing. Um, yes, I don't want to spend too much time on this because it gets a bit complex and we don't want to make it complex. Definitely not on uh, Wednesday anyway hump day isn't it <laughs> um okay so where to post on facebook um now remember i talked about how you can reach so many more people than are actually following your page or your group well this is a little bit more explanation about how you can reach those people so of course you're going to post your content on your own page or group but there are going to be many other relevant pages in your community on Facebook that other people have already created. And the same with groups. Now, with groups, you have to join the group, whereas with pages, you don't have to join a page. Scott, do correct me if I'm saying anything incorrect here, please. Um, now, when you join a group, you all you have to agree to their rules. And usually their rules say something like, don't spam, no political or hate speech. Um, fairly you know easy to sign up and agree to rules um, but it does mean you have to remember that if you're going to try and share content on other pages and other groups that you have to be respectful that you're literally on someone else's turf yes that's a pun and I put it in deliberately I'm not ashamed um, and that you are selective with what you share so share the, the stuff you think is going to be most interesting to that group um, and most relevant to them. And I certainly wouldn't post and share a post more than about once a month. Um, you, might, you might be blocked for sharing, but you shouldn't be as long as you're following the rules of that group. Anything to add there, Scott? Um, not really. Uh, the, the key difference here is Facebook is very technical on what pages and groups and individual accounts are and can do. So um, yeah, you had a good explanation of what they are, but those actually mean very specific things within Facebook. So just um, keep that in mind. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to pause again for any more questions on the last couple of slides. Okay, so um, there's one from the last pause, but I kept it for this one because mm. I knew the um, content of this next section. Um, one of the one of, a comment was, "What about TikTok for expanding into the younger audiences?" Absolutely, you can do that if you have the time. Um, yes, TikTok is used by younger audiences. You're absolutely right. Um, and that would be the most appropriate platform to reach them on. Um, I think if you have the time to do it, it'd be a really cool experiment to see if you garner interest on there and followers. Um, 
the only word of caution I would say is don't go down a rabbit hole of getting all excited about doing TikTok and neglecting the key demographic and the key people you're trying to reach because uh, hands up I've done it you know you've got on a new platform hey we can create this really cool content these videos and people are liking it but you don't neglect your key audience so I would say um, if you have the man woman power to do that great and I'd love to hear how it goes I think it'd be really interesting um, dip in to dip your toe in the water of trying to reach younger audiences Thanks. Um, this may be off, off topic, um, but you know, it's definitely related. So what's the best way to keep up with the changes that are made to the algorithms? It seems like things change so quickly with Facebook and Instagram. Absolutely right. Scott, you can answer that one. Um, I'm trying really hard not to just, uh, throw up like the shrug emoji, uh, <laughs> because you are, I, you're, it's, that is a dead on assessment of, uh, yeah, I work with Facebook and Instagram on a daily basis. And it's literally 50% of my job is doing social media for the college and keeping up with this kind of thing. And I, <laughs> I mean, I just keep trying slightly different alterations and like post times and what I'm how I'm saying things and phrasing things. Um, yeah. One nice thing is that Facebook, if you schedule things within their own um, scheduler, then they they have a thing that says like optimal times or they keep changing that name too. Uh, but they'll give you a suggested time when your audience is most on Facebook. And so they suggest that that's when you post. And so I've been using that more. Um, which turns out to be early evening, which I've never posted in the early evening before, but it keeps say, suggesting like posting at five or six o'clock in the evening. So mm -hmm. I'm trying that this week. I've never done it before. Um, we'll see how it goes and see if it's if it's helpful in getting more people to see our posts. So yeah, I wish there was an easy answer, but yeah, it's Kim called it the dark arts of the algorithm. That's very much what it is. They They don't want anybody to know what they are on purpose so um sorry i can't be more helpful i mean in terms of keeping up with changes that that meta is public about presumably there's some kind of email newsletter that people could sign up to from maybe a platform like hootsuite scott yeah there are um and i think you're going to cover some of the schedulers later a lot of those schedulers also have you know helpful tips and newsletters and news posts that they put out that yes I, I do look at those and follow them but mm. um yeah they're changing constantly and can be hard to keep up with so uh, yeah that's a good idea mm -hmm. okay a um, couple of questions about are there tips in the toolkit for phrasing you know for our posts I struggle with this and keeping it fresh so absolutely there are all kinds of tips in the toolkit yeah and I yeah and there's over 40 posts that I've already written for you um under different uh topics so right. you can follow that kind of phrasing as well I mean generally you keep it a little bit less you know you keep it less formal it's social media right um but uh and you know, try not to try to stay away from um, terms that only experienced gardeners would know, for instance, because that can turn audiences off who are really wanting to learn about gardening, that kind of thing. Just be mindful of, of those sorts of things. But generally, you know, there's over 40 already written posts in the toolkit. So that should give you a good guide. People are happy about that. Um, <laughs> but they are have, <laughs> took a while <laughs> do you have um a, an idea of whether posts or events reach more people scott um historically they were pretty much the same in the last year or so i feel like especially for like pages um which again is a very specific thing in facebook they've really been phasing out events because they want you to pay for those because um, events are uh, a lot of times things that sell tickets to. 
even though that's not how we use it for things and not likely how you would for master gardeners, but they've been phasing out events. Um, and the last couple of events I've had have gotten very little traction um, to the point where we actually did pay to boost one um, for 4-H because nobody was seeing it. So I would say posts now are doing better uh, than events. But you can always post about the event, right? So yes, you know. yeah, that's that's what we've I've started doing is just yeah. making posts about events. But Facebook note with their algorithm knows like when they see a date and time in it, they know that that's an event. So it it's trying to keep it of that algorithm. So it's it's tough. Okay. Okay. Anything I else? I don't see anything else on in the Q and A right now. Okay. So let me just yeah. Right, let's talk about hashtags. Um, so we had a question earlier about using hashtags on Facebook. So for those of you that don't know, a hashtag is literally that symbol that goes in front of a series of words or one word or a number, for instance. So the hashtag we are using for this campaign is EMG50 um, for obvious reasons. Um, won't work if you use spaces, spaces, punctuation, or symbols. And if you're using a hashtag that is longer, um, then you should capitalize the first word of each, sorry, the first letter of each word, because that means it's much easier to read. So you can see further down in the bullet points, um, we've got an example of first day of fall. Um, Make sure your accounts are public, not set to private, um, so that people who don't follow you can still find you and see your content and decide to follow you. Um, now, keep your hashtags quite short and ideally memorable. And I should have, I have got relevant. I was about to say, should have said relevant and specific. So um, an example of that is, um, you want to use ones that, like I say, are relevant and specific. So let's say you're talking about um, someone in the community who's had success from their first vegetable garden. You would then use hashtag EMG50. Then you might use organic farming, grow your own, homegrown, sustainability, or ones that are similar to that. Now, the great thing about hashtags is that you can research them. Um, so you can actually go into um, in, uh, Instagram and put in organic farming and it would tell you how many posts there have been that have used that hashtag. The purpose of a hashtag is that it is searchable. So let's suppose that you want some inspiration on organic farming for a post that you're writing. You could go and search in Instagram hashtag organic farming see and then see the posts and then you can scroll through and it, it's basically like almost you're seeing a story you're seeing every single piece of content that has had the hashtag organic farming put into that post so that it then means that if other people are looking for that kind of information then that's how they find it. So for instance, here's an example. I moved to Spokane, I knew no one, nobody um, I knew had their hair colored. So I went on Instagram and I put hashtag Spokane hair highlights. And that's how I found my hairdresser. So it's, uh, or you can put like, you know, food finder Spokane and, and you start to also find accounts that you want to follow as well. Um, so they are a way to categorize and to categorize your content and for people to find you that goes um, beyond you just putting your post out there. I find it quite hard to explain hashtags, actually. So I do have a video in this presentation about it, but I'm slightly concerned that we're not going to have time to watch that right now. Um, Jennifer, what do you think as chief timekeeper? The video is about six minutes. Yeah, I think we should keep going. A yeah. lot of time for questions. Make sure that you get your content out. And these slides will be made available. And they, folks can watch that video to right. um, further their. Yeah. 
So this is where the video is, but we're not going to play it now. It's six minutes. So it's a nice, short, sharp shock of a lesson about hashtags, why you should use them, how they work, and some tips and tricks that just add to what I've already said. Okay, so there we go, straight into questions on hashtags or anything else that is burning your brain. Maybe no questions. So I don't see any coming in yet. Maybe some okay. typing, but I would like a little more information on the question that was asked earlier about why why hashtags on Facebook and why not hashtags on Facebook? I don't understand why. I don't understand that. Okay. Um, do you want to answer that, Scott? I'll answer it as best as I can. Um, mm. I've never like researched why this is, but Facebook just doesn't seem to do well with searches okay. <laughs> in any way. Um, Facebook oh, is really that. difficult to search and so and that's what hashtags are basically for like Kim just said is for searching and so I think it might just fundamentally go back to that it's just not built into the backbone of how Facebook was designed and um, they've never really caught up on getting them incorporated that's my suspicion other than that I don't really know I just know that they don't really work okay um, people still think... use them but they don't work nearly like the real on Instagram. Okay. I think you're probably right. You know, Facebook came before Twitter, right? And I believe the first tweet that used a hashtag was, I, I was going to say a date and then it's going to be wrong, so I won't say it. Um, but I'm almost certain that the first post that used a hashtag was on Twitter. Um, and so I suspect that um, they just haven't kind of retrofitted Facebook to work very well with hashtags. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't use them. You should still use them. And I think I've, I explained that a little bit in the toolkit. Um, and the other reason is, you know, if you're scheduling your content, it just means you don't have to take hashtags out. Um, and you can post to Instagram and Facebook at the same time as well, just with one post. Um, but so in a nutshell, do still use them. They don't work as well on Facebook. They work brilliantly on Instagram. Right. And they aren't going to hurt. That's, that's the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is there a number that is too high for good hashtag use? I've heard over 11. Oh. Um, okay. Yeah. I've heard over 11. I did some research. Um you know, you'll see posts on Instagram where people are like hashtagging, like, like their life depends on it, you know. Um, but yeah, I've, I've heard sort of up to 11 is optimal uh, for Instagram. Um, I just think there probably comes a point at which some dark algorithm just perhaps stop even logging those hashtags. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if that's the case. Um, Scott, do you have any intel? And I think the person who asked this question just clarified. So she said, meaning some hashtags are very popular. Are there mm. some that have too, so many posts that it just becomes watered down? Mm. Well, um, potentially, but equally, if it's got that many posts, then it's a very popular topic. And why not be part of that conversation? So it's, you know, there's two sides to that, I would say. Um, again, I would just say, if you've got a really popular hashtag, but is you can say is really relevant to what you're posting about, then I would use it. Okay. Um, so do, where's the appropriate place to put a hashtag in the post? In the middle of the post, the beginning of the post, the end of the post? Scott? <laughs> Not the beginning, um, but if you can use it within the post itself, I think that's the ideal is that so if you're writing something about organic farming and you use the words organic farming, turn that into a hashtag. That's the ideal so that it looks more natural. Otherwise, I put them all at the end. Um, sometimes even I'll do like a 
a return with a period and then another return so that's even they're, they're spaced off uh, right. so that they're not taking up the what's visible it's for people that will see them on the if they click like the see more but it doesn't show up in the um, initial part of what people see on a post and but it still comes up in those uh, searches so uh, yeah within it or at the end is the best is what i found okay so i think i think we covered the questions for this session okay part of it okay so i said we would talk about tagging as well um tagging is another way for you to potentially um get your posts in front of more eyeballs so I've put here on the first bullet point an explanation of what tagging means. So let's suppose that Scott writes something um, on Facebook that he wants to draw my attention to. Um, and he puts at and then he puts my whatever my name is on that social platform. So let's say it's Kim Schmaus. Um, So it's literally a way of mentioning me. And it means that I will get a notification on that platform saying, Scott's mentioned you on a post. And then I'm more than likely to then go and look at that post and see why Scott has mentioned me. You can tag a person, though, but you can also tag a business or you can tag a photo. With a tag, you're always doing the, the at um, if you're mentioning a, a person or a business. Um, and once you've drawn their attention to your post, it again, it's sort of a form of social media flattery. They're more than likely to go and look at it. Then they're more than likely to react, comment or comment on it, which means that once they've engaged with your post, their own audience will be able to see that post. And if they share that post, their own audience will definitely see that post. Scott, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, but it's definitely really important, um, the, the tagging thing. Um, as an example, what I do is I do it only when it's relevant. But I, if I can, uh, I will tag like the at WC Pullman account if there's like some event that our college is doing on campus so that they will then hopefully share it and they have an audience that is four times what mine is and so if they share it that post is going to get a lot more eyeballs the key is to not do it every time because then they're going to ignore me and i'll get a phone call be like hey, stop doing this <laughs> but if it's relevant then you know it helps them get the word out about what's going on on campus and it helps me tell more people about our event. So it's this is, I think, more helpful even, at least in my experience, than hashtags, uh, mm. because it's a very direct way of interacting. It's almost like messaging them, isn't it, really? It's kind of almost like messaging yeah. someone, but it's public. Yes, it's uh, public messaging instead of direct messaging, kind of, is one way to think of it, yeah. Yeah. So when you say the second bullet, you can tag a person, a business, or a photo. We spoke earlier about pages. So we have we manage pages. Can you so that when you say business, can I can is that synonymous with page? Uh yes. Yeah. Can you tag a group, Scott? I think you can, can't you? I don't know. I've oh, never actually, really, I don't think not. I've tried. I don't think you can because but I, you I have don't to join know. a never, group. I've never tried. Yeah. Yeah. And and tagging an individual person from a business or a, a page can be tricky because I think they have to follow you to tag them. Mm. Um, otherwise, on Facebook, um, I don't know if that's the case on Instagram, but um, yeah, on Facebook, you have to the person has to be following you to for you to actually tag them in it because of their differences between pages and um, mm. individual accounts. Mm. And if you find you can't tag someone, it might be because of their privacy settings um, yes. that they've said that you're not allowed to do that. Yes, I've definitely been on a page where I've tried to tag someone and or in a group where I've tried to tag someone. And if you're not a member of that group, then you can't tag them. 
So there are restrictions. Um, however, it is a really, it's an excellent way of creating more engagement with what you're posting um, and getting more eyeballs on it. So again, I do have a video to explain. Oh, when to tag. There we go. I forgot about this. Um, so yes, these are scenarios in which you might decide to use your tagging option. So sometimes you might actually follow someone who posts some really great content themselves and you decide to increase their reach in a nice way by sharing their post to your page. And in which case you definitely want to tag them because you want them to know um, the flattery of you doing that. And then that might, then they might comment on the fact that you've reshared that, which then creates um, a switchback to their page and their followers. Um, another example might be you're including them in a, in a post um, and ways you might include them could be you might be quoting them from um, an article or a newsletter um, you, or a comment that they've made. Um, they might be included in a photo that you're posting or um, I'm trying to think or perhaps a video as well. So let's say you've got a video um, or a photo that you've done of planting a tree in your local community, then you'd want to tag the um, venue page. So let's say you planted it in a particular park. If they've got a page, you want to tag them. You want to tag the people who are in the photo. And if there was a quote or a comment from the person who was planting that tree, some kind of local dignitary, then you want to um, tag them as well. Um, if you want to post a question, you could be saying, um, you could even be tagging amongst your own pages, actually. So let's say WSU, um, sorry, Spokane Master Gardeners says, um, or WSU Master Gardeners writes a post about, um, oh, I'm making this up completely. Uh, we're finding over here in the Pacific Northwest that our raspberries are really not ripening this season. Any advice at Oregon? master gardeners you know and then you bring that group into that post now that's purely I know nothing about whether raspberries are ripening in Washington or whether Oregon master gardeners would have any advice on that but that's just an example of how you might pull another group or a page into your content um, and another time you might do it is if you've agreed a, a partnership so for instance it was mentioned I run a non-profit called Spokane Mama we have a partnership with another nonprofit called Spokane Birth Resources, and we have a social media arrangement where we tag each other in our posts, we share our content, only if it's relevant, um, and we make sure, though, that we're not spamming each other's audience um, with our content. And other example, the other example that Scott said as well, where you've got a legitimate reason that you work you're very close with another organization that has a page with a lot of followers like WSU Pullman, where the Department of Con Connors would say, hey, check this out at WS Pullman and see if they will then share that content and comment on it. Okay. This is a short video. We won't run it right now because we are um, at 10.53. Um, this is only about three minutes long and explains further on how to use tags. It is specific to Instagram, but you can easily find other content like this on YouTube if you just type in, you know, how to use tags on Facebook, for instance. So questions. There's a couple in the chat. So one, I think you answered it uh, already. But uh, the question is, do you need permission to tag someone or some page or some business? You don't need permission to actually attempt to tag them. But if you don't have their permission, you won't be able to. So it will just, you know, it just won't complete their name. You know, you'll have an at and then you'll try and write Jennifer mm -hmm. and it won't populate. Right. Um, and then people are wondering if there's um, you've you've both spoke about your research into how to use social media. 
Is there a book or a website or um, resources that you would recommend for folks to get and, and learn from? I would say any book is probably going to be outdated as soon as you order it <laughs> is the problem. Um, I'm sure, I mean, YouTube is your friend. That That is a really good resource for how to use social media and it's easy to digest and you can take it at your time rather than a deep dive into kind of any kind of book. Um, obviously, you want to look for the most current videos on there so don't be looking at Instagram from 2019 be looking for um, videos from 2022 um, again I would say probably sign up to so there are there are apps and websites like Hootsuite that is mentioned and talked about in the toolkit which um, allow you to schedule your content and monitor your and look at your analytics and advise you on your audience and how your your campaigns are working they will have email newsletters that you can subscribe to or blog posts that you can subscribe to that will provide you with updates on social media and i'm almost certain although i haven't checked that they will have tutorials as well scott do you have anything to add yeah, I, mean, I was going to say something very similar. Um, honestly, because it is a, those things, these things update so regularly. Um, Google the, the, how to use Instagram and just look at the most recent thing that shows up. And you know, there are certain, I mean, it's the internet, so some things are going to be just a little more reliable, but I've never found one that's consistently the most reliable. So I just try to look at like four or five different things and get an overall feel for um, accuracy as opposed to like trusting one site every time. Mm -hmm. And also keep in mind, like Hootsuite is very useful and has good information that they put out, but they're also a business and they're trying to make money and they, you know, they sell their products. So they're gonna, in their thing on how to use any kind of tutorials they have, oh, and by the way, we sell this or we offer this. this. So just you have to keep in mind that mm -hmm. that's, um, that's how they make their their money. So uh, they're not going to give away anything super valuable for free, but they're going to have some useful information for you um, that's publicly available. Okay, I have a couple more slides and then one final question session. So I'm going to just scoot on with that. Um, so there are many different content types, but these are the sort of six main ones that you can consider. And when you're planning your content, you might decide, OK, I'm going to do three edu educational posts a week and mix it up with two entertaining and one conversational. I'm not suggesting that that's what you do. I'm purely plucking that from the air. Um, and then you'll if you um, have time to, you'll be able to see which type of content performs best with your audience. And then you can decide to turn the volume up on that a bit more and do perhaps more of that content. Or perhaps you want to, you know, one part of your demographic um, might respond better to interactive content on Instagram, but educational content might do better on Facebook. So I really encourage you to when you're thinking about scheduling your posts, think about varying the type because not everybody is going to be purely interested in being fed. You know, education is feeding them information, whereas conversational is engaging them and it's a dark, more of a dialogue. Um, inspiring content or entertaining content often does well. Um, entertaining by that I mean it's more light-hearted um, it might be more jokey you know it's more your your cat and dog type stuff um, or um, yeah that that people just kind of get a little kick out of what makes people smile um, those things tend to do very well we know cats rule the internet they really do um, <laughs> and there's there's good reason because things that make us smile or things that you know make us click the like button make us feel good so you know I caution you against keeping it overly educational um 
And I would say definitely mix it up with some of these other things that will create the interactivity and the dialogue with your followers. Um, there is a risk, certainly, that you have so much content that is educational that you, you focus a little bit too much on that. Um, and my suspicion would be whilst that is helpful, that it might not be very engaging. Um, and therefore, you know, if you're not engaging your followers, they're less likely to like, respond, comment, which means they're less likely to be shown your content the next time you post. OK. And last but not least, I think this is the last slide. It is. Um, so this is just a little method for um, literally the process of what you should do from here on in. First of all, of course, you should read that toolkit um, and go back and watch the videos that are in here and perhaps do some of your own research on Google or YouTube. Um, and perhaps have a look at um, other groups and pages that you might want to connect with um, on your platforms you're already doing and consider um, if you want to expand to any other platforms, assuming you have the time and not neglecting your key target audiences. So you're going to decide on at least five different topic strands that you think are going to engage your audience. And when I talk about topic strands, I mean pollinators, um, organic farming, um, sustainability, you know, this is all in the toolkit as well, so you don't need to be making any notes here. Um, also select from the nine program priorities and the other ideas that are in the toolkit. So we don't just talk about the nine program priorities. There is a, a page that has lots of other ideas of the kind of things you could be talking about. Plan. So how often are you going to post? When are you going to post? What platforms are you going to do? and use a social media tool as your friend here um, you shouldn't have to pay for it because I don't think you're going to reach a level at which you need to Hootsuite is the one we've talked about because it's the one that always comes to mind but there are others available um, these are also talked about in the toolkit remember to keep your posts relevant and current vary we just talked about this now the themes of what you're talking about, the types of content, but also the media. You know, maybe you use photos, but maybe you can use an infographic. Maybe you can use a video. Um, you can vary the length of your posts as well. You know what? And have a look at what people are responding to. We will talk about that at the end. Utilize the 40 plus done for you posts from the toolkit. But please don't be afraid to do your own stuff. No one's going to bite your arm off. Nothing bad is going to happen. Um, I certainly don't think in any post that you're likely to be crafting that and you're going to get any real kickback on social media from that. Um, so be creative and have fun with it. There's so many things that you could talk about um, and you're, you'll um, get some nice feedback from your audience, I suspect, and get quite a good uh, kick out of that because it's really nice to see people engaging with the things that you've created and last but not least monitor your results look at what people are responding to what's doing really well at the end of the toolkit there are some examples of posts from the WSU um, Connor's uh, social media feeds that have performed well with some analysis of why they performed well and it's worth you doing this same exercise. And when you see these results, maybe after a month or so, you can then adjust your campaign as necessary. So if you find that um, certain content topics aren't performing as well, maybe you want to do less of those, for example. And questions. This is our last round of questions. So hit us with it. There's a couple right now. Uh, one question, one comment. So one question, how often do you recommend posting to social media? Depends on the platform. Um, some people over post <laughs> and uh, that just becomes spam and some people under post. Um, I could give you an answer and then you could go and Google it and find a completely different answer, to be honest. Um, I think I've recommended something like, I can't remember what I've recommended in the toolkit, to be honest, but I think it might be something like at least three times a week. Um, 
and we've even sort of said times of the day. Um, Monday to Thursday is going to get more traction than including a Friday. If you have the time to include Friday as well, great. Posts at the weekend generally don't do as well. Um, and posts, uh, again, it really depends on your audience. So if I was talking about Spokane Mama, I'd be saying something very different. Um, so, yes, at least three times a week. If you want to post once a day, great. If you want to trial the weekend, by all means do, but don't put your, your best stuff on the weekend because it's going to get lost. Scott, you can probably add to this. Yeah, absolutely, especially the weekend um, information, unless there's like a big event that you can somehow tie to. So um, again, my, my experience is going to be different than yours working for the college, but like on a football weekend, I might try and post something because there's a lot of people checking social media and following certain hashtags on campus as they're watering around and they want to know is the creamery open or can, can I go get some cheese? Um, so there's, there's, there's always um, special cases, but in general, yeah. And it very much depends on the, the platform. Um, Facebook, if I do it more than once a day, they start um, throttling and my audience goes down. I've just, I've noticed that. Um, with Twitter, I post three or four times a day and they want more content. So it actually, the more I post, the more often, the bigger my audience tends to get. Uh, Instagram, we post once a day as a post, and then we also try and do maybe one story a day. If anybody knows what stories are, we didn't really cover that, but um, it, it's absolutely dependent on, on the, the platform and, and what your audience will take and tolerate. Um, do you recommend following all those who follow you? No. No. <laughs> it's a simple answer. The reason being that um, if you follow them, your own feed is going to be, and your notifications is going to be so full that you will feel like you're being spammed. Mm -hmm. um, I would recommend only following people that you truly um, want to see content from, actually that is going to serve your goals. Right, right. Okay. Um, is there a culminating date for ending this campaign? You noted March 20 as the start. Yes, December 31st, 2023. Right. The culminating event for the year the, is... Uh, finishing, sorry, finishing up your posting about it. That's when we agreed, Jennifer, that, yeah, that we would finish the social media aspect yeah perfect yep um let's see so some people are asking for the toolkit uh it was it was included in the emails that were sent to you and I put links in this morning when I send out the recording of today's presentation I will also include a link to the toolkit there so you'll have it um April is National Volunteer Month, often a big social media month for Extension Master Gardeners. Do you recommend we capitalize on that? So that's all volunteers, right? Not just Extension Master Gardener volunteers, but all volunteers, it's April. So I think um, that's part of the April post ideas. Yeah, there's no reason not to. Um, absolutely. You can use it as another opportunity to celebrate and I would probably, you know, get some really impactful facts out there about, you know, been doing this for 50 years. This how many people who've been trained. This is, you know, how many tons of food, um, you know, we're, through our work that we've produced over a year. Um, yes, uh, is the short answer. <laughs> so lots of nice comments. Thank you for the presentation. Um, learned a lot. Everybody's looking forward to seeing, having the recording so they can um, see the recording and the toolkit kind of come together for them. So really appreciate your time. I do want to um, give a shout out to Debbie Benbow. She is part of this group who put the um, toolkit together. She did all of the design work for the toolkit and added a few pieces on photography. 
So thank you, Debbie, for your support. And um, she'll be able to help answer questions on using the toolkit as well. Anything else for the good of the group? No last questions. Looks like we covered everything in the chat. Great. Thank you so much, Kim, Scott, Debbie. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks Thank for coming, you. everyone. Bye.